Hey everybody, so yesterday, May 14th, I had the privilege of speaking to Mike Gravel, who served in the Senate from Alaska from 1969 to 1981. He ran for president in 2008 in the Democratic primaries, appeared in the debates that cycle, and had a number of notable exchanges with the candidates, including Hillary Obama and Biden. And he is now running again for president at the age of 89, after having been recruited to do so by some teens in New York, which is a very quirky and amusing, actually encouraging story. And we get into some of that in our interview, as well as a variety of other issues. So I hope you'll enjoy it. All right, Senator Mike Gravel, thank you so much for doing this. Well, thank you for having me on your program. So... I, like many, first became acquainted with you in 2007, 2008, when you appeared in those Democratic primary debates, and you definitely had a substantially different message than most of the candidates. I'm sort of curious to hear you reflect back on what you perceive as the impact of your presence in those debates and in that race in 2008 more broadly. Well, I I don't think I had that much of an impact. Uh, I think... Obama came in and sucked up all the oxygen uh, and uh, overwhelmingly won. And unfortunately, he didn't accomplish anything other than getting a black man elected. But what's happened is that all of the uh, video, I was in seven debates, all of the videos and the debates uh, registered, but not sufficient from a campaign point of view. And now what's happened is my celebrity or notoriety, whatever you want to call it, is energized by all those uh, debate uh, present uh, points made in 07, 08 are now fueling uh, the, the present possibility of a debate uh, or my involvement in a debate, assuming we can uh, get the 65,000 votes. So that the effect, it's interesting. Yeah, I think you'd have to conclude that I was ahead of my time in 08, and it seems that the message that I have then is very germane to the present. Right, and you now have a group of young people who are running your social media accounts and so forth. How, how do you assess their performance so far? Well, very good, and... Of course, it was a big surprise to me because when David Oaks called me and said, when I run for president, and I pointed out to him, do you have any idea how old I am? <laughs> well, I'm 89 years old. And uh, so I'll be 90 next year when the convention <laughs> takes place. Uh, but what the point he made, and I think it's valid, is that uh, – it's the issues that count, not necessarily the personalities uh, or the age or the participation of the individuals. And so the other thing that they used to persuade me was that uh, they had a, a bevy of uh, positions and issues that uh, that I ascribed to. But the one that they had at the top of the list, because they had done research as to what floats by boat, and that was the creation of a legislature of the people. And that's what I think is the most important contribution I can make to this debate is that the, the likelihood, and of course, I'm very supportive of Bernie Sanders, Kelsey Gabbard, and, and uh, Elizabeth Warren. And so, but the likelihood after they get elected to these high offices uh, of their being able to enact their agenda is somewhat limited. Because if you look at the dynamics of the Senate, uh, I think we'll get control of the Senate, but not with 60 votes uh, to spare. And that means that a minority of Republicans uh, who, had, as a group, are crazy as all get out, they would be able to sabotage and thwart any of the advances we would hope to make with the agenda items that uh, Bernie and Tulsi and Warren talk about. So that leads the question is, uh, how can we get uh, these progressive, this progressive agenda enacted? In my mind, the only way we can do it is to empower the people to make laws by creating a legislature of the people 
uh, whereby people can turn around and enact policies in partnership uh, with their elected officials. Now, the elected officials presently have a monopoly on lawmaking, and that's what we have to change. And I'm just completing a book that will be out in mid uh, in midsummer, uh, which essentially is a manual for the implementation uh, of a constitutional amendment and a federal statute, uh, the, uh, the, the uh, Legislative Procedures Act. And so with these two uh, legal elements, the people would be able to uh, enact legislation addressing all of the items that Bernie talks about and uh, Tulsi and the others. Uh, so that that really, without the legislature of the people, I just really uh, uh, have great fear that we won't be able to get that much enacted that needs to be enacted. You brought up the issue of age, and there's been discussion about how the leading candidates in the Democratic primary field anyway are quite old, at least by historical standards. I mean, it hasn't often been the case that you had people in their upper 70s, um, you know, being seen as the leading contenders for a presidential nomination. To what extent do you see scrutiny of that as a legitimate course of action? I mean, do the voters have a right to try to um, assess whether a Joe Biden or a Bernie Sanders has sufficient cognitive capabilities to be able to uh, carry out their, their duties with sufficient vigor? I think so, and uh, I think that, uh, look at my age, uh, to be able to uh, write a book, uh, make myself available for interviews at uh, 89, uh, you know, I would have never thought I'd lived this long, but, uh, but I, you know, when I first ran was uh, when I was in my 70s, and so, no, I think Bernie Sanders acquits himself extremely well. As long as he's healthy, uh, he's good to 95. And so all we need is four uh, four years of him. And hopefully within that four years, we can enact the legislature of the people. They will get his agenda through. Now, uh, I'd like to see him with uh, Tulsi Gabbard as vice president. Uh, She's not quite 39, or she's just 39. She's 38. Uh, She's 38. She's 38. Well, then, uh, you know, it wouldn't be a crime to have her serve as vice president for eight years or four years uh, and get additional experience. She has a lot of experience right now, six years on the legislative, uh, six years at the Foreign Relations Committee and six years on the Military Affairs Committee. Uh, This, in my mind, equips her to be able to, and she's the only one. Now, Bernie has joined her to a degree, and that is to... Uh, address the problem, the the excesses of the military industrial mm-hmm. complex, and uh, and so what's real sad is that you don't see any of the here. You got twenty plus candidates, and nobody's really addressing the military industrial complex other than uh, Tulsi and Bernie. Now, uh, what does that say? <laughs> they get elected to anything; they'll just be puppets of the military industrial complex, and that's what's wrong with our society right now. Right. So I'm curious to actually hear you go into a little bit greater depth about what you see as the key differences between Tulsi and Bernie. So famously, Tulsi resigned from the DNC in 2016 to endorse Bernie. Uh, they're, obvi- you know, they're, they're personal friends. Um, I've interviewed her at, at length before. And it seems to me one of their key differences is that Tulsi is a little bit more forthright in discussing, as you mentioned, the issues associated with the military-industrial complex, foreign military adventurism. Even just yesterday, Tulsi appeared on a very popular podcast with Joe Rogan and said that she would see to it that charges were dropped against Julian Assange and Edward Snowden. And I don't see Bernie really going quite that far. So I'm wondering you know, what your interpretation is. No, Bernie uh, is focused uh, on domestic issues, and uh, and he's even admitted. In fact, I realized this in, when he was running the first time, and I contributed to his campaign. Uh, and he's admitted that he hasn't focused a great deal on foreign policy. Well, foreign policy is vital, and he claims that now he's uh, he's paying more attention to that, 
and and that's fine with me. But like I say, if he had Tulsi Gabbard as his vice president, or vice versa, if she had him as her vice vice president, uh, that would be very very helpful because he's he is expert on domestic issues and uh, has experience in that regard. And Tulsi, of course, has expertise uh, beyond that. So I uh, I don't fault Bernie for that. Uh, you know, a member of Congress can only focus on so much uh, to be effective if you're going to be effective in certain areas. But if but if you want to, you can be a broad gauged uh, person uh, covering everything. Uh, my uh, I I defer a lot on uh, domestic issues like. Here, I'm not making myself expert on single payer health care, which is what I believed in and have from the get go. Uh, there are several other areas that uh, now I have uh, spent time on economic matters to try and figure out how we can get around the shortcomings of capitalism. Uh, but but here, too, it's a question of so many hours in a day. And if you're a member of Congress, you've got to appear for the votes uh, and for your committee work. And a lot of times that doesn't leave time to broaden out. Now, Tulsi has the advantage that uh, with her two committee assignments, which incidentally are very unusual. Now, these are two powerful committees. Generally, a member doesn't doesn't get that kind of, uh, of committee assignments. Now, another person that I think is very, very help, uh, wonderful on the scene, and that's uh, Corte uh, Alexandria. Corte AOC. <laughs> yeah, Alexandria Ocasio Cortez. Okay, I, I'm very impressed with her, and of course I agree, and uh, and I think Bernie has joined her on this uh, Green New Deal. Uh, th- th- this is just vital. I mean, it and and in the book I'm pointing out that one of the suicide uh, tracks that we're on is of course the environment. Now the Green New Deal would just uh, set us in motion to provide not only to address the problem domestically, but to also get back on track internationally. Because in, until we get a commitment internationally on this subject, uh, we're going to have some real problems. Now, we, there's no question we are one of the uh, foremost polluters, but this, the, the problem of growth uh, that's going on in the world is, it has to be addressed. We can have growth uh, in an environmentally sound way. The question is, you have to want to do it. And so we're, it's all muddied up with these Republicans who, who just really uh, are reinventing the wheel. And that's about it. I voted for Bernie in the 2016 primaries. have always been transparent about that. But I have noted that he's made occasional statements here and there that raise a little bit of concern. Uh, You know, he's at times seemingly given credence to the more conspiratorial notions of the Trump Russia matter. Um, He's commented on Venezuela in a way that a lot of even his supporters objected to. How how do you sort of advise people who are, you know, otherwise inclined to support him who react negatively. First off, off, uh, what were his uh, comments on Venezuela? I I was not aware of that. Do you Uh, recall? um, I I don't have them in front of me, but But but, but basically he was saying that my... uh, I, I, I'm, by, I'm paraphrasing, but he was saying that you know that Maduro is a is a dictator and basically should be should be ousted in some manner. He seemed to be giving at least tacit license to the Trump administration strategy, although he never has endorsed military intervention. Um, but but it, it did cause a lot of people to get upset who are otherwise supporters of his. Well, I think that they're they're holding too tight a standard. Uh, what what he said is accurate. Uh, Maduro is a bit of a fool and a tyrant, but uh, but the answer to Maduro's uh, or Venezuela's problem uh, with Maduro is not is not to be uh, affected by us and he, because he doesn't believe in intervention, but it should be the people. And what really what I would advocate is is we don't need to make these uh, these sanctions 
on Venezuela, which we've been doing for over a decade. Uh, here, stop the sanctions, because what we're doing is we're the ones that are contributing most to the, uh, this, this, uh, the dysfunction of the Maduro government. And so if we stop the sanctions, uh, then maybe they could get their act together economically, whether it's, uh, but, but here again, uh, if the people want to get rid of Maduro, they could. Uh, they have held elections. Maybe the elections weren't all that great uh, and democratic, but then again, our, our elections uh, have the same problem. All you got to do is look at what happened in, in Georgia with uh, Stacey Abrams. You know, she would have won had there not been rank suppression by the Republican uh, organization. So it, we, we're, we're not now, so holding Bernie to a standard on Venezuela that uh, really isn't realistic, the holding of the standard, not his position. I think his position is realistic. Maduro is the problem, but we can't discern whether it's the problem Maduro has a problem with himself or the fact of what we created. And what we've created is the dysfunction of the government through sanctions and it's murderers because it's reported that over 40,000 kids will die as a result of our sanctions. Now, uh, the whole sanction approach uh, to foreign policy is ridiculous because what it does is it empowers the tyrants who we claim we're sanctioning but the effect is on the ordinary citizen and the poor, uh, because our theory is, well, we sanction the country and though it affects the ordinary and the poor, then what they ought to do is revolt as a result of our sanctions. Now, this, this is bizarre thinking and immoral thinking at best. And so I would not hold Bernie to that tight a standard. Uh, having served in government and in the military, you know, these issues are very clouded, and many times uh, there's there's not a up and down answer. But I think with respect to Venezuela, one, we should stop the sanctions. If anything, help their economy get back on its feet, and then if the people uh, are, have a desire, they can get rid of them. That's that be my approach. Okay, and as far as Russia, I actually do have a statement that Bernie made. <laughs> Um, in 2017, he said, quote, what hold does Russia have over President Trump? And he suggested that Trump was carrying out foreign policy at the behest of the Russian government and not serving the interests of the American people. That always seemed like a major stretch to me. If you look at Trump's policy record, there's been a lot of belligerence toward Russia. Um, and it just seemed like Bernie is kind of legitimizing aspects of the Russia conspiracy narrative that has been pushed by you know, the democratic establishment. Well, it is the democratic establishment. A lot of times, unless you get a chance to study it, uh, that you fall into the trap of the conventional wisdom of the establishment. I think it's, it's, it's crap. Uh, there's no, here, you want to talk about control of elections? When uh, Yeltsin was running for re-election, we not only paid for the entire election, but we sent over our uh, our consultants to manage the election in in Russia, uh, and of course this was the period when all the oligarchs were raping uh, the country of their uh, resources. You know when you see uh, individuals become billionaires in a month's time or six months time, you got to realize that there's something really bad happening. Well, that was happening under Yeltsin, and we made it all possible. So for us to now say, well, the Russians are interfering in our elections, it's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. And uh, the, we do enough damage to our elections that we don't need to, any foreigners to get involved, but foreigners will. They're, now that we have the Internet uh, and uh, digital uh, communication and digital data, uh, anybody can mess around with any election in any activity economically. I don't know if you're aware what happened uh, in 17 about uh, the, uh, the, the hacking that nearly brought down the global or American 
uh, economic network by by what was done to Marish uh, lines and uh, and how that ricocheted into the rest of the economy. So no, we're we're, we're advancing into a very critical technological area that I don't think is properly addressed by addressed by the candidates. But but whatever is addressed is best addressed by Bernie, Tulsi, and Warren. How do, how do you diagnose why it is that yeah. Democrats, as well as much of the media, have fixated to the expense of most every other issue on this Russian narrative for so long, and even now they're on the same track? I mean, you have Congress issuing these uh, contempt declarations with regard to the attorney general. Um, you have, it's always on the top of the agenda or so it would seem in Washington. What fundamentally is the reason why that this has become such a preoccupation? Well, because uh, it's the, it serves the interest of Wall Street and the uh, military industrial complex. And they uh, essentially controlled uh, media. They control both parties. Make no mistake about it. The the Democratic Party has got its hand out over there, and you see that with uh, the support for Biden. Where's Biden's support coming from? Obviously, it's mainstream media, and mainstream media is controlled by Wall Street and military industrial complex. So that that influence is going to be uh, present in the Democratic Party, and it has been present all along. Uh, the question is is and of course, when we say that the person is a centrist, there's no such thing as a centrist today in the Democratic Party, because what the Democrat, the, the party has been moved over to the right, starting with Clinton, Bill Clinton, uh, and it's moved over to the right. So when a person says they're a centrist, they're saying that they're they're on the right. They may not be to the far right, uh, as the religious nuts are, but they're but they're in the, between the center and the far right. When what we have to do with the election of Bernie and Tulsi, uh, what we have to do is pull the uh, the center back to the middle, so that when a person says I'm a centrist, he really means he's a centrist, and so we can do that by pulling the party <clears throat> over to the aggressive, uh, uh, politi- uh, the progressive political agenda, and and that's the reason why I, I feel very constrained. When I hear Democrats saying, "Well, we got we, we we can't go for the whole thing," you know, we have to be centrist. What they're saying is they're compromising before they even engage in the battle. And this is what happened with uh, Obama with the health care situation. They gave up in committee when Obamacare came out of the House committee. Seventy plus percent of Americans wanted single payer, and they didn't even include that option. And the argument that they made then and still make now, oh, we couldn't have done it. We could, you know, here, I'll tell you that as far as I'm concerned, Obama's going to fail because he's getting mental diminishment every day when you see him. And so it's going to get worse between the next 18 months. And so what we should do is go for the whole enchilada. I think if we go for a progressive agenda, we will win and we will win substance if we go for, quote, the right middle ground uh, that uh, that Biden is aspiring. We won't get anything but a replay of the uh, Obama administration. You mentioned before that you're you know, roughly supportive of, of Elizabeth Warren, and I do agree that many of her economic policies anyway are well considered. And um, I think she does have a breadth of experience that's unique uh, on on those topics. But I did note that she was on the floor of the Senate around two weeks ago, reading into the congressional record parts of the Mueller report. And it actually brought to mind what you did famously decades ago in reading into the congressional record, the Pentagon Papers. But Warren seemed to be putting on a bit of a show because unlike the Pentagon Papers, the Mueller report is, is accessible to anybody with an internet connection. <laughs> so I, I, I'm just okay. not sure what she's going for there. Well, first off, don't hold politicians too narrow a, a criteria 
you know, they, they need visibility. They recognize they need visibility to to hawk their wares, to push uh, and get elected. And so I, I don't fault politicians for that. I do fault politicians for, let's say, like a, a uh, and of course, he's very bright, uh, Beto, uh, you know, jumping around like he's got St. Vitus dance. But but what what he you know he he still doesn't address the issues the way Bernie Tulsi and uh, Warren address them and that's the same thing with Buttigieg uh, you know he what horrified me was his statement that uh, Tulsi uh, not Tulsi uh, Chelsea Manning uh, he didn't understand how she could get pardoned by by Obama. Uh, from a 35-year sentence, the, the longest sentence ever meted out against a whistleblower. And not and, pardoned either. He was uh, Chelsea Manning uh, was commuted. Yeah, well, that's right. And so And so now, and she's out of jail right now because the grand jury, uh, where the judge put her in jail, the grand jury ended and they're now convening a new grand jury. And so we would fully expect that she would be probably held in contempt of that. But, but the, the, you know, for, for Buttigieg to, to raise that issue gratuitously just really disturbs me. Uh, he, you know, he, he, he's more and uh, raising that issue like he did really guarantees that he's going to be a puppet of the military industrial complex. And God, we've had enough puppets uh, in high office, subservient. Uh, to the military establishment. Yeah, the phenomenon around Buttigieg is a little curious because, you know, he's the mayor of a relatively small city, South Bend, Indiana, um, and yet he has gotten a significant bump in the polls where he's now a somewhat of a top-tier contender, and you know, he's you know plastered on all like uh, the prestige magazines, and his personal life is celebrated uh, what what do you see as the basic reason why liberals in particular are seeming are seeming to take such a um a fondness to him well probably a little bit like the situation uh, with uh, obama you know the liberals uh, the fact that he was a black man running for president and was credible in that regard uh then you know you 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 get your liberal bona fides by supporting something like that and i think there's there's elements of that with Buttigieg because he's gay there's no question the gay community is delirious uh with this advancement and i don't fault that in the slightest uh, but by the same token uh Buttigieg does one thing that's very valuable to the military industrial complex he doesn't question that he doesn't question Wall Street. Uh, and so prior to Biden getting on the scene, it was important for the military industrial complex uh, to promote him via their control of the media. So he was sucking up the oxygen that should have gone to more meaningful uh, public servants. And so, so that's what I attribute it to that he's not a threat to the military industrial complex or Wall Street. And and he does have a, he's bright, there's no question about that, but he articulates a lot of mush, uh, which I mean, you know, bring us together, we're going to compromise and all of that. God, we've seen that, we see that every, every election cycle by all politicians running for office who think that, see, you see, they don't want to get into ish specifics because, you can alienate people with specifics as you well as you can gain supporters. But the where he where Buttigieg is as advanced, and and you'll see, and of course he's riding a crest of media attention that was engineered uh, by these forces of Wall Street, uh, applying it to the um, and the military industrial complex, applying it to mainstream media. But now that Biden is on the scene, he'll suck up uh, his oxygen and people will become a little more credi- uh, credible in examining Buttigieg's positions. Like, you know, he's uh, been in the service, but we don't see much of a description by him of the service that he's rendered in the military. 
And I'm very curious about that. I haven't bothered to do research in that regard, but I think that would be something to look into. Aside from Biden, who uh, we'll discuss individually, who do you see in the field as the most insidious presence right now? I don't know. I haven't focused on that facet of it to see who's who's most. There's just so many in the field uh, that, uh, you know, I'm in the process of finishing up a book uh, on uh, which is going to, in my mind, be very important in addressing the problems and solving them by the people and not by representative government. So uh, I don't think I can answer your question. I, I just have not paid enough attention on all the candidates to see who's, who's uh, occupying the bottom. Okay. Um, I actually want to ask a little about your, your history. You moved to Alaska um, in the 60s, not long after it achieved statehood, and you forged a political career there relatively quickly and at a somewhat young age. Um, how, how did that inform your uh, worldview, you know, in a, being in a frontier state? I actually was able to spend some time in Alaska last summer in Juneau, and it was, you know, beautiful, uh, beautiful geographically, obviously. Um, how did that inform the values that you brought to elected office? Well, I brought my values to Alaska. Uh, I became a globalist after re when I was 16, 17 years old. I read a book by Emery Reeve called The Anatomy of Peace and how peace could be attained. And so when I went to Alaska, I had been working in politics since I was 15 years old. And I went to Alaska when I was in my late 20s. Now, I went to Alaska before it became a state. I knew it was going to become a state. But uh, when I got to Alaska, I ran for the territorial legislature and lost. Then I ran for the city council. And that was within 18 months of being in Alaska because I, I went to Alaska to run for public office uh, and to become a senator and or a house member. And so uh, I, I lost the city council race. Then I ran again. Uh, now that we're a state, I was able to run for the state legislature. Uh, and, and was elected uh, in a plurality and then went from my freshman to becoming, getting reelected with the largest number of votes in Anchorage and, uh, and parlayed that into becoming Speaker of the House. So I went from freshman to Speaker and was motivated to do get a lot done because operating on the theory, uh, I was ambitious, I want to get elected to the higher office so I got to show accomplishments. And so we did, I did do, provide unusual leadership at that point in Alaska's development. But, but in Alaska, uh, I, I just enjoyed the beauty. I was always suspicious to people because I didn't hunt or fish, but I'd love to go walking uh, in the mountains. And I did the Choku Trail. We did the, we did the trail that, uh, that surrounded the around the backside of the Chugach Mountains of Anchorage. Uh, and any opportunity I had, I would, I would just go hiking and camping, but never never killed a bear, never killed an animal or anything like that. It's just not in my makeup. And, and how did you deal with the harsh winters? Because in Anchorage in particular, you know, that can get a little difficult to deal with, right? <laughs> More than that, uh, you know, I worked, uh, I, I concentrate on real estate because that was a way to, to get my name out there. But I also worked one, one winter on the uh, Alaska Railroad uh, as a brakeman, I might say. And then when I had a development called the Alaska Village, trailers would move in uh, and, uh, and I would have to hook them up uh, and sometimes 40 degrees below zero out there, you work for about 20, 20 minutes, get in, warm up, then go back out and do another 20 minutes of work. Uh, and, uh, and so, no, I've experienced, in fact, the coldest I've ever been was on a campaign trip to Delta, Alaska, where we stayed in a uh, motel. And in the motel, uh, where, you know, there was a top heat uh, and dressed 
and what ha- and the temperature was uh, 62 degrees. That's cold. <laughs> and w- w- where, where is that in Alaska? In Delta, Alaska. But the, w- where, where, where regionally is that? That's in the middle of Alaska. Okay. That's in the north of Fairbanks, in the northeast of Fairbanks. So in the tundra. Well, it's all tundra. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, not 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 Juno actually where I was. It's not no, tundra. No, Juno in southeast is fjord country. That's why it's so beautiful. When you get up to uh, when you go beyond Yakutat, you're up into Prince William Sound. You get a different kind of beauty, uh, and then you go north of that up in Mount McKinley in that area. In the Alaska Range, that's a diff- and uh, that's a different kind of beauty. Then you get the Brooks Range, that's another range that's up in, within the Arctic Circle, and that's another kind of beauty. And then, of course, you got the Deep Arctic, which is really uh, beautiful in in its starkness, uh, not darkness, starkness. So it, uh, uh, I've uh, I've always was blessed that I would have to campaign around the state and do nothing more than in the process of enjoying the beauty of Alaska. Uh, I miss it now, but of course at my age, the winters get longer and colder, even though there's, there's uh, environment, the uh, climate wa- uh, warming in Alaska, but it's still, every so often I'll compare the, <clears throat> on my iPhone, the, the the temperatures in Anchorage and uh, where I'm living now in California seaside uh, and the temperatures in other parts of the country. So with, uh, where I live now, it doesn't get too cold and it doesn't get too warm. And it's always by and large sweater weather. weather. Right. So uh, you were defeated in a primary election in 1980. Um, what What were the circumstances which led up to that, to you having faced primary challengers, um, and what was that race like? Well, it, it's like anything else. When you lose, uh, there's a certain uh, attitude, or you, f- you feel defeated. But what what was going on in, in my mind at the time is I was advocating uh, an economic approach uh, that was somewhat complex. And so I devoted half of the money I raised to pushing for the enactment of the uh, the, uh, the the AGSOC, the Alaska General Stock Ownership Corporation, which of course is a process that could be used nationally to alter the 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 the, the, the bad effects of uh, of capitalism. And so what happened is I was the, most of the accomplishments that I had as a senator were always were in my first term. And that's unique to most men, members of Congress. Uh, and the second term, I was not as successful in getting things done that I thought were important. And, and slowly I took on issues that alienated uh, basic constituencies of mine the fishing community in the smaller uh, communities of Alaska were angry with me because I was a supporter of the, uh, the law of the sea. Uh, the native community was angry with me because I wouldn't support uh, the Alaska lands deal, which Stevens and others had organized, whereby the environmental community was able to lock up excessively uh, Alaska. Uh, and so, by the time I was running for re-election, one, I wasn't, uh, I really, my heart wasn't in it, but I had no place to go. I, I wasn't, I didn't get into the uh, Senate with, with any substantial wealth, it was, uh, and I didn't come out with any. So I really didn't have a place to go. But my thought was, if I got re-elected, then I would concentrate on uh, the, the Alaska, uh, the AGSOC, uh, the, the Alaska Stock Ownership Corporation, which was buying a piece of the Alaska pipeline, and they would throw off three or four hundred dollars a year to every single citizen of the state, based upon uh, their ownership of this capital uh, emplacement, which was of course the pipeline. So, uh, when after I left office for about ten years. 
never got involved in politics, never made any speeches, uh, did not, uh, a group essentially wanted me to run for governor. I just didn't want to have anything to do with politics. Uh, and so what had happened about 10 years out, uh, after being a consultant here and there, not very successful because my heart wasn't into making money uh, or nor my intellect, but it, it just dawned on me because I had been grappling with this problem, uh, how to solve the problems, the shortcomings of representative government. And so it dawned on me about 10 years after, which would be about uh, uh, 1989, uh, 90, uh, and it just hit me, the answers to people. It's, it, you know, there's only two venues for a real change. And that's the government, which chooses not to do it because that would disrupt the control by the elites. And the people who, who do not have, under the Constitution, defined uh, powers to be able to enact laws. The lawmaking, which is the core of, of human society, the core of human governance, is, is, is held by a monopoly of representative government. What we do is on Election Day, we give our legislative power, our sovereign power, to representatives, and then they hold it as a monopoly. They're the only, the only ones that can make laws at the federal level. Uh, and uh, and so all we can do is protest, beg, write letters, hope that these elected officials will do the right thing. But when in point of fact, these elected officials are financed uh, by the forces of Wall Street, the military industrial complex, and first and foremost, their position is to protect the status quo. And if they got an extra amount of time, maybe help the people to some degree. That's that's where we're at today, and that's the reason why the, the name of the book that I'm working on is called Human Governance, The Failure of Representative Government and a Solution, The People. Hmm. So um, in the very first debate in the 2008 primary cycle, there's a clip that you can still find on YouTube, obviously, where you're discussing the Iraq War. And the moderator, Brian Williams, asks you to name candidates on stage who you feel have done a particularly poor job in combating the Bush administration's approach to that war. And at one point, uh, Joe Biden raises his hand and waves at you, and you respond saying, quote, you have a certain arrogance to him. Because at the time, Biden was promoting this plan where he wanted the U.S. to impose a partition on Iraq. And your point was that it took a certain amount of arrogance to presume that the U.S. could tell Iraqis how they should govern themselves after having invaded their country and, you know, destroying it. Um, That's accurate. And, and of course, you want to carry that forward because Joe's uh, leadership of the uh, Judiciary Committee uh, during the Anita Hill was equally arrogant. Now, see, it was arrogant on his part to make the decision that when you had two other witnesses that would cooperate, uh, Anita Hill, and he chose not to call them. And he chose also to unleash and let our inspector savage, uh, like a terrible uh, prosecutor, Anita Hill. Well, th that's arrogance. Now, uh, and, and, you know, and it goes with power. People that have power for a long time develop a certain arrogance. That's the reason why our judiciary situation is really such a mess, because the, these these judges are elected for are appointed, not elected, appointed for life. That means that you know you can talk about corruption, which is putting your hand out and getting a bribe, but the the intellectual corruption many times is much more serious and much more debilitating to the processes of governance. Uh, that we see by uh, here, if power corrupts, it corrupts absolutely everybody. And so if power corrupts, uh, obviously our judiciary system is rampant with this kind of uh, arrogant corruption. But what, it got, what about the arrogance in particular that he displayed when he was touting at the time his plan to partition Iraq? Well, here again, that, that's part of foreign policy. 
First off, he voted for the war, which was which was ridiculous. This was probably the worst uh, foreign policy mistake in all of American history. And so after voting, for, it takes a certain amount of arrogance that, of the people who voted for the war to think that you can go into another country, uh, do away with their leadership, and think you've solved the problem. And then when you've realized that you've lied to get into that position, then what you say, oh, we're there to establish democracy. This is a little bit like the naivete uh, of Woodrow Wilson in setting us off on a trajectory of unlimited wars when he made this statement that they, and our entry into the First World War was an effort to make the world safe for democracy. Uh, or, uh, you know, these, these are platitudes that mean nothing. Uh, what you have to measure is what these actions that are done by arrogant uh, people holding power, the, the, you, you measure that in loss of life. And, and like what we're doing in Venezuela or what we've, do, what we've done in other countries, you know, under Clinton, we what, had 500,000 children die and, uh, and the Secretary of State, Mal Albright, said, well, that was collateral damage. That's murder. And, and, you know, you you heard the cliche is, uh, you know, kill one person and you're a murderer, you kill a million and you have a foreign policy. Right. It, 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 go ahead. No, that's okay. I, I just, I just spent my bullet there. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> um, voters have been asked recently to describe why it is that they're supporting Biden. And often what you'll hear is them saying something to the effect of, well, the overwhelming priority right now has to be to defeat Trump. So we don't want to get too involved in the policy disputes within the Democratic Party. Everything has to be toward defeating Trump. And even some of Biden's early endorsers in the Congress, particularly in the Congressional Black Caucus, where a few powerful members have endorsed Biden already, their logic is similar where they're saying Biden is best equipped to defeat Trump. He's the most, quote unquote, electable. How, how do you respond to that kind of rationale? Well, first off, he's not the most electable uh, nationally. He's never been successful in that regard. Uh, secondly, uh, they're, they're, they're making a compromise uh, that need not be made. There's a time to compromise. That's if you can't get anything better. <laughs> We can get better. We, try, well, what I think the Democratic Party right now, which is so obsessed with the uh, with Obama, with uh, with the President Trump, when you have to just accept the fact that Trump is a narcissistic fool, and he holds uh, the, the power uh, the, the, of any more power than any other individual in the world holds, uh, but recognize. If you look closely at Trump, and there's been a psychiatrist uh, who has uh, really defined uh, Trump's uh, trajectory, uh, where right now he's getting more uh, losing mental acuity, and and he will, but in the next 18 months, Trump will lose the presidency. We don't have to worry about making all kinds of compromises. Uh, with reality and with what's possible, because Trump is imploding, and and it'll get worse. And so, if somebody engage, were to engage him in a debate, you know these these other Republicans that he beat the last time, that was one style that he used. That style is no longer operable. Uh, fine, it it will sustain his base, but you're talking about 25, 27 percent of the electorate, which are dumb as fence posts. Uh, and so we don't have to worry about that. What we have to worry about as Democrats is not to do foolish things. And what I considered foolish was the minute he was elected, everybody called it, not everybody, a large number of Democratic leaders and fundraisers calling for his immediate impeachment. There was nothing to impeach him on at that point in time. And right now, uh, the impeachment would go nowhere. It would just suck up the oxygen when the people want us to accomplish things. And so what the Democrats ought to focus on is passing the best legislative package it can and sending it over to the Senate and watch it languish uh, in no activity at all. And this will set us up to the same thing that Harry Truman had with the do-nothing Congress that got him reelected. So we don't have to go after Trump. 
what we have to do is is get the leg- progressive legislation that's so important to benefit our citizens, get that passed, sent over to the Senate, and let the people look at the Senate in its stupidity and its ignorance. Uh, and so, but but then at the same time, just let Trump get he'll get all the visibility that you need. And in this visibility, he will make a fool of himself, which is really what he is down deep. And so his diminished abilities, his diminished capability, mental abilities uh, are, are eroding away from him. And that's what the, the psychiatrist was observing uh, with respect to the way he slurs, the fact that he can't read anymore, uh, and he and he is, he's really always uh, taking an issue and dumbing it down to uh, whatever uh, crosses his mind. The da- there's dangers in that, and we have no control over that because the like of Pompeo and uh, Bolton, you know, they can play him like a fiddle. In fact, somebody wrote an article uh, titled that, that Bolton's playing uh, the president just like a fiddle and, uh, and will get him into a war, and I don't think um, that uh, he'll... He, he's interested in going to war. He's more interested in the ego visibility, which is, of course, uh, which what he did with Kim and what he wants to do with Iran is, is have them talk so he can get the, the, uh, these photo opportunities with, quote, our enemies, uh, who are not really our enemies. But so the, the Democrats should just concentrate on legislation uh, and that they do have a responsibility of oversight. And so I think that the various committees that are looking into getting information about Trump's personal ac- economic activities, his misuse of power, is uh, is, is trying to, uh, to overcome uh, judicial actions. It's fine. Investigate that. But uh, make that. But unfortunately, the media is going to focus on that as opposed to focusing on the need uh, that uh, AOC and Bernie uh, have, are articulating with respect to doing something about the Green New Deal. Uh, now, that's got some attention, but, it, but that's, the, that's what's important. Right. Gerald Nadler, who's the chairman of the House Judiciary Committee, was overheard making a statement of some kind that his intention, you know, roughly speaking, was like you said to endorse or to impeach rather Trump just after he was elected, and that also plays into why Democrats started immediately proclaiming that Trump was a pawn of Russia or you know, compromised by Russia somehow. And not only could there be political disadvantages to that, as you laid out, it also has had the effect, I think, of ratcheting up tensions with a nuclear armed power. To the point that we're in a we're in a very precarious situation in that respect. Well, there's no question about that, uh, and that's one of the flaws. Now, I'm not familiar with Nadler's initial comment in that regard, but I'll point out that you don't need uh, a comment by Nadler or the Republicans uh, to realize that, uh, and this started in Obama's administration, that the uh, the Department of Defense has been authorized to $1.7 trillion, mind you, uh, to refurbish uh, our nuclear arsenal. Now, when you look at the record of cost overruns with uh, uh, with the military, uh, you appreciate that $1.7 trillion is really $3 plus uh, trillion dollars that we're going to spend on nuclear refurbishment when, in point of fact, these nuclear weapons are not usable. Anybody who were to unleash 20 or 100 nuclear devices would trigger the planet into a nuclear winter and we're all going to die. That, that's what's going on. And, and, and the Defense Department has said this is our number one priority is to refurbish our nuclear capability. And like I say, with $3 trillion, you could take care of education, you could take care of the single-payer health care, uh, you could take care of a whole host of needs that are required. But no, uh, this is the Republicans to a man voting for this and also 
you don't hear any Democrats, candidates, who members of Congress talking about this. This is the heart of the military industrial complex that Tulsi Gabbard and Bernie are talking about. And so we're, 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 we're three trillion dollars on a weapon that in point of fact can't be used because it's a suicidal weapon. Could you envision a scenario where you do choose to endorse one of the candidates, whether it's Tulsi or Bernie, if you feel that they most adequately, adequately represent um, the issues that are dearest to you? Well, there's no question about that. Now, uh, you know, I've made a statement via the kids who run my campaign that I'm running to win. Well, uh, I, I think I have a little more humility than many of the other candidates because I think the likelihood of my winning, even though I'm trying to win, uh, is not very, very high. And, and so if that being the case, as we, and if, it's, if that becomes evident, with as a result of more accurate polling and presently polling is not accurate as to what's going on uh not that the technology is not accurate it's just that it's just too early to be able to let things filter out and so once that's done there's no question that i would uh endorse hillary and tulsi uh and warn bernie and tulsi not hillary (laughs) what did i say you said you said you said hillary which is the polar opposite of what you meant <laughs> no, it's it's Bernie, Tulsi, and Warren, uh, where I would uh, concentrate uh, my uh, endorsement and efforts and and efforts because uh, I'm in it uh, as long as I'm healthy, and I think that I've got maybe five more good years of health that uh, I would just uh, work my heart out. Now, the best way to do that is with the publication of my book. Uh, which which actually uh, takes the agenda put forth by uh, by the people that I would support, takes that agenda and puts it before the American people and give them the tools to enact that agenda. And that, of course, would be the most destabilizing thing that could ever be done to bring to heal the elites that control our society. So in 2000... <laughs> In 2013, I I was fascinated because you took part in what was called the Citizen Hearing on Disclosure, which dealt with, you know, unidentified flying objects and that sort of thing. And it was sort of laughed off because the instinctive reaction on the part of much of the media is to, you know, dismiss any discussion of that as kooky. But sure enough, a couple years later in 2017, the New York Times broke a story where apparently the Pentagon had a secret program where they did investigate UFOs. And apparently this was done at the behest of Harry Reid, who you know represented Nevada, obviously, where there is uh, you know, maybe a disproportionate attention to this issue. So I'm wondering how you reflect on that and what, what was your reaction to that revelation when it came out? Well, first off, the hearings uh, that were set up uh, one week long with several former members of Congress uh, listening to the testimony was just awesome. I was extremely impressed. Now, I came at the issue uh, because I don't have any great expertise, so I don't have the time to really dig in uh, to the issue. But I came at it very simply with a view that I think it would be the height of human arrogance to think that there's not other sentient beings out in the cosmos. We're just beginning to make sense uh, and knowledge of the cosmos, just all the attention over the black hole. Here, here again, if you look at the cosmos and you say, that, boy, look at us, there's got to be something else out there beyond us. We can't be the only, the only ones. So that's where I come at the subject. I don't focus my attention on a great deal of study over that. You know, here again, we only have, we each have only so much time, and uh, and I focused my attention on solving the problems of uh, governance, human governance. And, uh, and that's what this book that I hope to finish here shortly will make a contribution in that regard. I never felt uh, until the kids came along asking me to run that I would live to see the possibility of direct democracy. But as a result of the visibility that I was able to get, thanks to the 
a campaign initiated by the young guys that are running my campaign, that this visibility gives me an, an opportunity now to put this manual of how we're going to bring about a legislature of the people, to put that manual out there so people can see it. Now, we have thousands and millions of people who have passed through and focused on uh, my candidacy or many issues that I promulgate. Uh, now, once the book is out there, uh, then the manual, and, and I was putting it out, hoping that somebody in, in, in a number of years might focus on it and say, after an, another terrible tragedy, and say, well, this is the answer. We have to find a way to make people empowered to make laws. And it's in the manual that I talk about doesn't only apply to the United States. It can be done in any country. In fact, I would hope that it would be done in the majority of OECD countries. And as a result of that, we could then reorganize the United Nations and bring about a world federation, which is the only way we're ever going to see peace on this planet. And how did you react to the revelation in 2017 that the Defense Department did, in fact, have a program to analyze, um, you know, aerial activity that was of unknown providence. So they, they actually were taking this issue seriously, and Harry Reid was involved in, in getting this program funded. Well, I, I reacted to it, uh, same old, same old. In other words, we are beset in this country with an unbelievable amount of secrecy. Uh, and and it, it does not serve us well. Because if you really want to be a healthy, functioning democracy, the people have to know exactly what their government is doing in their name. And that way they can weigh in. But we don't even have anything close to that because everything is, and, and, it, and it's a natural for people in power to want secrecy to protect uh, what they do wrong uh, because then they'll advertise what they do right. But the secrecy will protect them in, the, in, in that regard. And so, uh, and that's what, uh, what would happen if the people are able to make laws uh, in a deliberative, now I, I'm talking about a very deliberative fashion, and then they will be able to put aside the secrecy to, to know what's going on. The, uh, the recent article by uh, Chelsea Manning uh, about talking about a book that she's working on, uh, you know, she, she doesn't want to write about the, uh, her, her trial and what happened to her in, in, in captivity and the torturing and all. She doesn't want to write about that because most of that is, is considered uh, confidential and secret. But why the hell shouldn't we know about what happens in, in our prisons? Why does that have to, our military prisons, why does that have to be secret? Why do we have to have secrecy surrounding Guantanamo Bay? Yeah, this is ridiculous. Uh, the let me give you an example of secrecy. We uh, we have a troika, uh, a triad of nuclear. When we talk about refurbishing our nuclear establishment, uh, we have the establishment which is a triad. That is that back in the fifties, in order to placate admirals and generals. We gave a piece of the nuclear pie uh, to the Army, a piece to the Navy, and a piece to the Air Force. Well, we now say that the reason why we need the triad, that if our enemy were to launch an attack and knock out one of the elements of the triad, the other two elements would be available to retaliate. Truth of the matter is, if anybody were to attack us in a serious fashion, fashion at the nuclear level, then then of course they'll trigger, we don't need to retaliate, we're going to die anyway, We're going to, because they'll trigger a nuclear uh, winter. Now, what we could do as a matter of foreign policy, and it would be very meaningful, and that is to do away with the uh, Army triad, do away with the Air Force triad, and we still have the Navy uh, element of the triad, where we have uh, 12 Trident submarines, each one has 280 nuclear warheads. Now, if you can imagine 280, that can hold the world hostage. So we would be more than secure uh, with one leg of the triad. And, and I would not do away with these two other legs uh, in negotiation with another nuclear power. No, we should just do it. 
It doesn't threaten our security. We should just do it, but we would then prove to the world that we're serious about bringing the nuclear capability worldwide down to zero. Now, uh, that would, and then of course what we could do is we'd have some legitimacy to then call, have the, ask the UN to call forth a conference made up of the eight nuclear powers plus uh, Japan uh, and Germany and India and Indonesia. Uh, and then, uh, th then we could have a meaningful uh, negotiations to do away with the nuclear capability. And, and what, who would join that? Kim Jong-un would join it just with the others. And Israel too. You know, they, they don't own up to the fact that they've got nukes, but uh, we would invite them to a conference. And that kind of a conference where we have, we have really demonstrated our bona fides by doing away with two legs and, and not doing, you know, doing away with these two legs of the triad on a quid pro quo with other nuclear powers. Just demonstrate. And there's no risk to it. Uh, I'm reminded of McNamara being questioned at the end of his uh, his uh, tour as the Secretary of Defense. Somebody asked him, well, uh, how much could we really cut the defense budget without threatening our security? He said 50%. And, and McNamara is probably one of the brightest persons we had uh, at, uh, at the head of uh, the Defense Department. So no. These are the directions we need to go, and these are the directions that are basically not addressed by uh, the, the the plethora of candidates we have running for president. All right. One last question, and it actually relates to your broader point about direct democracy. I don't know if you saw this, but just last week, the citizens of Denver successfully passed a referendum to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms, which in the past had kind of been discounted as something that only hippies are concerned with, but actually there have been a lot of rigorous scientific studies demonstrating that consumption of this substance can alleviate depression. People with um, severe illnesses have taken them and it has re you know, reduced their mental stress and trauma. Um, and I know that you've been vocal about declaring that the war on drugs has been a failure. I'm just wondering what, what your response to that, you know, somewhat groundbreaking initiative was, if you happen to see it. Yeah, it was a referendum, not an initiative. Uh, the initiative, uh, I used to call uh, what I now call the legislature of the people, the citizens initiative, national citizens initiative. Uh, the, most people aren't very familiar with the initiative process. And so therefore the terminology it's easier for people to understand is you're going to be part of as a lawmaker of the legislature of the people and this can be uh, this is all laid out now uh, from the people's point of view uh, they don't realize that they, they do a lot of lawmaking uh, whenever a school board puts forth bonds to build schools or to build infrastructure uh, the entity in question and the people vote on that. They're voting to encumber themselves with this debt. Well, th that's lawmaking at its finest and most extensive. So there's there's no miracle in uh, or or it's uh, you know talking about the people being able to make laws. Now, a referendum is different. The Brexit is the classic example of that, where uh, where you had Cameron, Prime Minister Cameron. They kicked the can down the road and asked for a had a referendum on whether or not to stay in the EU. Now the tragedy there was that that was terrible lawmaking because the people were not informed. When I talk about lawmaking, I'm talking about deliberative lawmaking, where you have a process where the people can become knowledgeable and educated about the the intricacies of the issue they're about to vote on. And so that's not what happened in Britain. And so now you you see this whole brouhaha over uh, over Brexit, when the only answer was uh, by uh, the comedian uh, who who pointed out uh, that uh, that the answer is to declare that referendum void because the people weren't given the information about the consequences. And so, but no, the politicians are so steeped in their, their stupidity uh, and digging a hole 
it, it's just beyond it. And so this will not only damage Brexit, will not only damage Britain, it'll damage Europe and damage us and the rest of the world. So, no, you've got to be very careful when you're talking about, and, and no, I applauded what took place in Colorado in this regard, and what took place in a number of states using the initiative uh, to, to, to get uh, the acceptance of, of cannabis or marijuana. How tragic is it uh, that here you have a plant that's been known from the Middle Ages to have some, some very beneficial properties. Uh, and of course, it can be psychedelic uh, too. But, but why, why deny the ability to research it and to tease out what these properties are that are so beneficial to human beings? We have not done any of that to speak of. And I, and I hope that we would overcome uh, the ridiculous position held in the United States that we have to have a war on drugs. What we ought to do is decriminalize all drugs and follow the pattern of Portugal uh, in letting people who have drug problems be treated as a public health issue rather than a criminal issue in that regard. And are you familiar at all with the substance of what was approved in Denver last week by a referendum, this particular drug, which is seen to have a lot of potential in curing a lot of you know, psychological maladies? Very much so. I, I read the article in the paper about it. Uh, and something that came across my my computer screen. Uh, and so I, I'm just very happy. Whenever you see some advances in this area of human governance, uh, it makes me extremely happy. What I'm trying to do by creating a legislature of the people is to accelerate that process. Because the people, when, when you look at the people, uh, they you have a choice right now. You can be governed by a minority, or you can be governed by a majority. The majority are the people. And so that, that's the reason why I feel so deeply about the work that I've been doing for the last 25, 30 years. This legislation, this manual that I've written about creating a legislature of the people, didn't jump on the table. Uh, it, it had to be discussed, vetted, and, uh, after a, and it was written over a 25 year period. And so what you'll see next summer in this regard is going to be the product of all of that effort. And, and here, too, once the people are empowered in a deliberative way of making laws, you'll see such a change in, in the governance of our society. And if we can do it in the United States, to race around the world like wildfire until we find a way to organize the world as we move into a cyber society. We're going to be in deep trouble uh, more than we've ever seen in the past. Well, I want to thank you for uh, spending uh, an extended period of time with me. I'm actually curious, since you launched your campaign, you've done a number of podcasts, which are more uninhibited than typical media and allow people to actually express their thoughts at full, you know, at full uh, volume. Um, what, what, is, what, have, what has been your experience doing these podcasts? How do you, how do you perceive it? Well, it's, it's, it's an opportunity to speak out on, on issues and uh, give warning and all of that. And so here again, uh, I feel I have a certain messianic drive in this regard. And so getting these podcasts, getting these interviews gives me an opportunity to get a message. And the message that I'm trying to get across is very difficult. And that is that the answers with the people the, with deliberative democracy, the answer is not with our leaders. And so when I look at the presidential candidates running for office, I winnow it down to those who have a decent agenda. But will they be able to get that agenda enacted? I, maybe in a small portion of it, regardless of who's elected president, a small portion of it will get enacted, but all of it could be enacted if you empowered the people to make laws. And we have to find a way to break, and I think I have with this manual, break the monopoly that representatives have on lawmaking and a, a monopoly that sustains the 1%, the elites, to control our society. Okay. And on a practical level, um, according to the dictates of the DNC, 
candidates need 65,000 unique donors as one of the criteria to be able to um, enter the debates. How are you doing on that front? Do you anticipate that you're going to actually gain entry into the debates? Well, uh, all I can do is ask my uh, campaign leaders, David Oak and Henry Williams and others, uh, to what's the status. And uh, David told me that we were at 35,000 uh, voters at this point in time. And we have, what, raised maybe close to $80,000. And they're, they're using the money to now advertise to try to get more people uh, to, to vote in this regard. So will we make it? I don't know. But even if we don't make it, we'll continue a campaign of information uh, that will sort of invade uh, on, a, on a segue kind of way into the campaign that's going forward within the Democratic Party. Now, I've given up on the Republican Party. That's, and and the, the statements made by presidential campaign, oh, they're going to cooperate with the Republicans. Republicans have been on a, on a suicidal mission to destroy the Constitution, and they've succeeded to a great degree. But we don't need to compromise with them. We need to take this agenda we know to be correct and put it before the people and let them make it the final decision on it. Right. Okay, well, maybe after listening to our discussion, there will be some uh, people who are encouraged to, to donate and to you know increase your total, so maybe you uh, have a better opportunity to, uh, to enter the debates. So that's a potential function of, of these types of conversations. So I just want to thank you again for, that, for taking the time. Well, thank you for uh, having me on and letting me go on and talk about these problems. All right, Senator Gravel, thanks again. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. All right, there you have it. I hope you found it edifying. I sure did. Please remember to subscribe on Patreon. Uh, you can support financially through PayPal. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. And also, please subscribe on YouTube where I post additional non-podcast material. All right, see you soon.